Uh, God, you made a way out of no way. Woo. And we are standing here today only because, ah, listen, you made a way. I'm going to hold space for this too right now. As we get ready for this message. Mm. And as we are in this fourth Sunday community ritual flow, we're going to have one that's weaved throughout. If you know that God has made a way and you are only standing here today, only because God made a way, I want you to drop the number five in the chat. Today is going to be a chat interaction day, if you can. Think about the last time God made a way. This is going to be important in, again in just a minute. Everything in this flow is leading into this message. Hallelujah. Let me get my five on. Wait a minute now. I can't ask people to do what I'm not doing. I'm on five fives. Yes. The number of God's grace. Only because. God, you made a way. Hallelujah. Sometimes it's hard to know what to do when you feel like running in the Zoom room. Mm. Your energy is like this. Because y'all know I would run out of that pulpit behind Dr. Lisa Allen McLaurin and do a lap around the sanctuary. God, you made a way. That's Woo. right. Listen. There are some made away folk in this Zoom room right now. Uh, I believe there's some made away folk. God made a way in that hospital. Come on, come on, come on, Omi. God made a way on that surgical table. You made a way. There are some folks on here that's been rubbing five nickels together, but God, you're still here. Eating them good peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. You made a way. It's some remote working folks on here that are ready to throw laptops out the window, but God. But God, but God. Listen. <laughs> but God. Hallelujah. Body racking with pain, as they used to say. But you made a way. Hallelujah. And sometimes God made a way through other people who showed up just when you needed them to show up. Thank you. That's right. Give God the praise in this chat. God receives chat praise. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm about to dance like David danced. <laughs> Woo! I hear you, Brother Chief. Go on and crank it up. Hallelujah. We started on time, so we got a, a few minutes, but I'm going to get us out of here on time. Amen. Woo! All right. Fade away. Fade away. You, you made a way. Don't know why, but you did it. You made a way. Don't know why. You made a way. I don't know how, but I'm thankful that you made a way. You made a way out of no way. You made a way. I don't know why, but I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Yes, I am. I don't know why. But I'm thankful. Don't know why you did it for me, Lord. I don't know why, but I'm thankful. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I don't know why, but I'm thankful. Oh, Lord. oh yeah. Mm. And we're standing here only because you made. And we're standing here only because you made. And we're standing here only because. 
you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Standing here, standing here. Glory to God. Woo! Mm -mm. That God is good. That God is good. Hallelujah. That God is good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Only because, well, hmm, this word is going to show us how to make a way. Hallelujah. Is that all right today? Because <laughs> we're going to stay in this warrior energy. Do you know your praise is a weapon? Listen. Uh, I'm going to just hang that right there and keep it moving. Right Listen. there. Mm -hmm. Right there. The season of wisdom. And we've been focusing on the ways in which wisdom and the calls of the elders and those who came before us call us to stay woke. Mm. To know what time it is. I remember when I was a child and we used to be at uh, the ELA and then Black Liberation Day parades and probably at my mama's school and somebody would yell out, what time is it? And everybody would respond and say, it's nation time. Mm. Some folks on here old enough to remember that it's nation time. My God, my God, my God. Mm, 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 mm. You know, it's a tragedy when you're in a battle and you don't even know it. Come on, America. This is the reasons why this country is in such a mess because many folks refuse to believe that we're in a battle, even with our own 45, a homicidal battle, a battle that started during his campaign for president. Yeah, I didn't turn the political corner already. All the signs of the war were there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put a praise on it though in a minute. And then four years of battle raged after that. Uh, but how many of you know that giants do fall? The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Ah, because God makes a way. This text today is gonna focus on David. I don't know if you knew that when y'all chose to dance and sing like David danced. And this text focuses on David's before he became king, because that's, that's the David that I can work with. Amen. David did a few things after he became king. I ain't dealing with that David. I'm dealing with pre-king David. <laughs> and I'm going to exegete some of this text as I read so that we can get quickly to the meat of this thing that we need to get into. Hallelujah. I got to give you the backstory. This is a long text. 1 Samuel 17 has a lot of verses. And so I'm not going to be able to read the whole thing. Some of you all know this David and Goliath text. David, who was this young shepherd boy who was chosen to be anointed. Uh, he was the youngest of his parents' children. He was the youngest. He was out in the back. He was a shepherd. Nobody paid attention to him. And then he got called to be king, called to come into Saul's court. He was a shepherd and he was a musician. And so Saul called him to come and to play music because Saul was troubled in his spirit. Mm. And so we're going to pick up, oh my God, help me, at verse 31. Let me see if this will let me share this screen. Yes, it will. If I can do what I need to do here. Man, can y'all see that? It is not letting me do it. Look at this manuscript, but that's all right. I'm going to look over here until I can come out of there. Amen. Here, 1 Samuel 17, 31 through 50, and I am reading as usual from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Read, Rita. When the words that David spoke were heard, see, David heard that Saul's army was afraid to go and fight the Philistines. And David couldn't understand why Israel's army was afraid. And David said, I'll go down there and I'll fight this Philistine. 
And so we're picking Preach up there. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, people in the army who heard it. And he sent for David, he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him, because of this giant. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are just a boy. And he has been a warrior from his youth. David was probably, I told y'all I'm gonna exegete up in between here, so don't get mad because I'm disrupting the text. David was probably 17 or 18 years old when this happened. He had served as a musician in Saul's court, probably from around the age of 12 off and on because he got to return home from the court. And this Philistine, and Baba Coleman, I agree with you, uh, was probably a descendant of the Nephilim, the giants that emerged after, if you look in Genesis, I think it's Genesis 6, the giants that emerged after the sons of God, it said, procreated with the daughters of humanity. Uh, these, some referred to them as angels, some referred to them as fallen angels, but they got attracted to the daughters of humanity and they procreated and, and some believe that these Nephilim, I'll go to Bible Coleman's Bible study and get more information, amen, were emerged from the earth. They also could have simply been exceptionally trained warriors. Uh, they also could have been a group of people with giantism in our modern day understanding, which causes people to grow to these extreme heights of eight feet and nine feet due to the overproduction of growth hormones. It's genetic, but the ancient writers didn't understand that. And so they were describing as they always did what they saw uh, in the natural as having a spiritual perhaps reason. Verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant, referring to himself, used to keep sheep for his father whenever a lion and a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went after it and I struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the, draw, the jaw and I would strike it down and I would kill it. Mm. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. So be careful when you say, may the Lord be with you and also with you, where are you sending them? Ah. Saul clothed David with his armor he put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped on Saul's sword over the armor and he tried to walk, but he walked in vain for he was not used to them. Y'all remember when I preached this and I acted this out. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi or from the river or from the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine, it's called Goliath, came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. Now let me pause right here for those of y'all who came out of certain church traditions. The armor bearer, this is what the armor bearer did. The armor bearer didn't carry your Bible for you into the pulpit and keep people away from you after church service is over. I'm moving on. When the Philistine looked and saw David, uh -huh, who going into battle with you, uh -huh, he disdained him or despised him for he was only a youth, ruddy or red and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David and his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the field. Y'all, it's getting real out here. It's getting real out here. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the God of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Mm. This very day, God will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head 
and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You made a way. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword or spear for the battle is the Lord's and God will give you into our hand. Are you still here? We almost there. And when the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a slingshot and a stone, striking the Philistine and killing him. There was no sword in David's hand. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For just a minute, I want to tell you to do this. Get your stones. Get your stones. Hmm. Y'all know I got to take this off of here now and get out of here and get out of this PowerPoint and get back into Word. Amen. Get your stones. I hope you already have them in your mind because God made a way. Hmm, 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 hmm. Get your stones. Get your stones. Most people don't root for the underdog. Hmm. Y'all know what it was like to have an underdog team. Were you the underdog that nobody picked to be on the team? Nobody likes to root for the underdog. But oftentimes the underdog comes out victorious. You see, Saul did not believe that David was fit for battle. He was young. Has anybody been told you're too young to do fill in the blank? Uh, or do you remember when you were young? <laughs> and folks thought you weren't fit for the battle. And then he was a shepherd. He tended sheep out in his father's land. He was a musician. Uh, he played the harp. He didn't walk around with swords and with weapons. He battled in the spirit musically. He was not a warrior trained for physical battle or so they thought. The text says that he was handsome. He was attractive. Now, I'm not sure how being attractive disqualifies somebody for being a warrior. I don't, I don't understand that, but it's reminiscent of the assumptions that we make today about people's appearance, often underestimating their strength and their intellect based on how they look. But David says, let me tell you something about me so you can stop making assumptions. Let me, let me engage in a little self-definition and some storytelling. David said, I killed lions and bears. I needed him to add that tiger so I could say lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And this Philistine, he said, this Goliath is gonna be just like the lion and the bear that I slayed since he's defied the armies of the true and living God. You see, David's past victories, you made a way, gave him the confidence that he needed to face Goliath. You have to remember your last battles and the last time that God gave you the victory so you can put a number five in the chat. <laughs> and then you have to remember your ancestors' battles and the, the strides they made and, and the ways in which they overcame. You have to remember the battles that your, your, your ancestors made so you can stand with some confidence. Some of you have been trained in this boxing ring called life and it gave you some skills. Some of you right on this Zoom had to largely raise yourselves because mama and daddy couldn't be there for you. And you had to not only raise yourselves, but you had to go through the emotional pain and, and, and the trauma of all of that experience and still come out all right. God made a way. Some of you have survived what seems to be insurmountable odds, but you are still here. Life for you ain't been no crystal stair. 
Some of you learned how to navigate your emotions and your heart alone because nobody was emotionally available to you. But as you did so, you learned how to be in tune spiritually. Am I talking to anybody right now? Remember the lions and the bears that tried to kill you. That tried to kill you, but they failed. Ah, this is the season for remembering. You didn't know how it was going to work out the last time, but it worked out. Can I get a witness? I say on me. Last Sunday, we remembered our bodies, Brother Arasto, but today I want you to remember your victories. Don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on your victories. David went out to battle and Saul tried to fit him with his armor. Y'all know I preached this before. I like this right here. But David said, I can't even walk with this stuff on. It doesn't fit right. Why? Because it's not mine. And so y'all remember I preached that sermon, put on your own armor. Because you can't fight the battles you need to fight trying to put on somebody else's armor. We have sisters and brothers all over this country trying to wear somebody else's stuff. And they are losing the fight, trying by imitation or by association to do like other folks do, to look like how other folks look. There are churches all over this country trying to do church like everybody else does church, trying to do ministry like other folks do ministry, putting on the same armor, the same way of worshiping, the same toxic theologies, as Frederick Douglass said, that keep us fit for slavery, trying to espouse those theologies for people. And people are leaving the same way they came. But how many of you know that copycat armor won't fit? On Friday night, Aaron and Baba Omotosho on Spiritual Time talked about folks doing art just to be famous and just to do art to get what other folks have, but they're not really being artists to, to bring about transformation. We need our own approaches and our own armor. It was obvious to Saul that any army uh, and, any ar and any army that David needed armor. He needed armor, that was obvious. But as we talk about wisdom today, David needed to see beyond the obvious. And so he had to look inward with his third eye and connect with his truest and most authentic self. That's why you saw that third eye candle up there doing the libation. The third eye is not just for looking outward and interpreting the world. The third eye is not just for you being deep and smoky and hotep, amen, and eyes shape. But that third eye is also there so that you can look inward. The pineal gland that connects you to having a conscience so that you can see within. David took off Saul's stuff. David looked within. David understood himself. And in his self-actualization, David said, this ain't mine. And I can't roll out and slay giants in somebody else's stuff. It doesn't fit. And then this is the focal point for today. It said David went down to the river to get what he needed. I'm, 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 let me go and wipe the sweat. David went down to the, the brook, to the river, to get what he needed. Dr. Lisa E.J. Oma preached, wisdom is a river. He went down to the river and it said, and he got stones from the river. The river, this natural, he went to his natural environment. He went to the brook, which was a part of the river, which was a part of an ecosystem that contained it, contained the tools that David needed to win. The brook, it was the river that shaped and formed the rocks and made them smooth. It was the river that carved them and shaped them and made them ready so that David could use them for battle. David was a naturalist. He was a shepherd. He spent his days and nights outdoors with the sheep in the wilderness. He had fought the lion. He had fought the bear. He had studied the ecosystems around him. He was an ecologist and a zoologist. He knew what was going on around him. And so he said, you know what? Get these swords and these spears and this stuff off of me. Let me go down to the river. Shall we yeah. gather at the river? Yeah. Shall we gather at the river? I'm going to lay down this sword and this shield down by the riverside. Uh-huh. I'm going to pick up these stones. And I'm going to pick up these stones. He drew from the river the things that he needed to fight. And so church, as we engage 
this community ritual, and I'm going to jump back to this manuscript because I need to pull up this PowerPoint. Amen. I want to ask you today, where is your river? Can I talk to somebody today? Where is your river? Oh, my God. I'm going to pull it up today. Because it's not going to be hypothetical or rhetorical. Family, where is your river? Where do you go to draw the tools that you need to slay giants? What traditions do you draw from when you are in battle? Where do you go to heed the wisdom of the elders? Do you know where the elders are gathered? Shall we gather at the river? Where do we go as a community? Or where have we been going to get through 2020? Where have you been going? What rivers have you been visiting in 2020? Where do you get your stones? I said, this is not going to be rhetorical. And so uh, we're going to go right back to this chat. And I want you to write in that chat, what is your river? And I'm going to start. Is that all right? I'm going to be interactive just for a minute. That's good, homie. Family has been a river. In my life, women is approaches to religion and society has been a river. You don't have to type it in the chat if you don't want to. But I encourage you to answer the question, where is your river? What is your river? We're going to hold space. Hallelujah. When you needed God to make a way. But see, God invites our participation as God makes a way. What rivers have been calling you? Oh, that's good, family. I see them coming. Music, yes. Community, yes. Parents and grandparents, yes. Even on Zoom, staying connected. Yes. What's in your ecosystem? <laughs> What's in your environment where you can go get what you need to get to slay giants? Then there's another question. There's another question. There's another question. <laughs> what stones do you have? What did you get when you went down to the river? <laughs> Jesus, I want to run. What did you get? What stones do you have? Goliath comes out to David in full armor and what would have been considered advanced weaponry in that day. Goliath might have been nine foot nine, some scholars believe, with a bronze helmet on as well and bronze armor and a spear made of, of bronze and metal. And he comes out and he insults David because of his appearance. Little boy, what you doing? What you think you about to do, little boy? Little cute little boy. What you about to do? Who are you? You ain't nobody. I can break you down easily. And then he spouts insults not only at David, but at David's community and at God. And I can easily break down what that looks like today because we hear it all day, every day on the TV. We hear Goliath all day on the TV uh, 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 criticizing us and, 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 and spouting a ridiculous rhetoric and propaganda at us. We see Goliath on the street corner waving flags. David just goes down to the river and it said he got five stones. Why five? The number of grace, five. The number of God's goodness, five. The number of nonconformity in some traditions, five. The number of balance, the number that brings things into balance, five. Study the golden ratio, the number five. It said he got five stones. 
And then he goes and he said, he put the five stones in his pocket. He had a little shepherd's pouch and he put the stones in his pouch and he comes back onto the battlefield. And I can see David coming out there like Beyonce, like Queen B, singing, they'll never take my power. My power, my power. They feel a way, oh wow. Boom, ba, boom, ba, yeah. If you haven't read the song or seen it, you got to see the song. David said, they'll never take my power. He has confidence in God. He has confidence in who he is. He has confidence in who he is rolling with. He said, the God of Israel, uh -huh, whom you defy, will deliver you into our hands. Sometimes that old time religion that was good enough for our ancestors, that old time religion that's good enough for our elders is good for us, but you got to get it fitted for you. You see, we don't come with what them other folks come with. We have spiritual traditions and spiritual technologies. We have ancestors that show up when we show up. We put them in our slingshot and we call their names in libation. The Bible also says, whosoever will call on the name of God shall be saved. And so we call on God's strong name. Uh, what stones do you have, family? What are your five stones? Write them in the chat if you haven't already. Because they feel a way, oh wow. But we have five stones. We have black liberation and womanist theologies and post-colonial theologies and queer theologies and Afrocentric theologies. We got five stones. I have Jacqueline Grant and I have Katie Cannon and I have Renita Weems and I have Emily Towns and I have Marcia Riggs. And these are women I knew and know and whose works I've read, amen, and who were on my dissertation committee. And I've walked with them and I've talked with them and they've lectured in my classes and I've lectured at their school and they are mighty stones because they can help us to fight Goliath. We have libations and we have ancestors and we have Orishas and we have Ashes and we have sage and we have humility and we have wisdom and we have discipline and we have love and we have reciprocity and we have Harriet Tubman, we have James Baldwin and we have Patrice Lumumba and we have Marielle Franco and we have Octavia Butler, mighty stones and we have a soul center and we have a Damn. soul food cipher and we have the proverbial experience and we have pink robes and we have the flow and we have a black oasis Man. that is coming uh-huh we have the blessed the belt of truth Man. and the breastplate of righteousness and the gospel of peace and the shield of Preach. faith and the helmet of salvation uh-huh and the sword of the spirit i could go into another hoop right here but i want a collective hoop right here what are your stones Do you have five smooth stones? <laughs> Our elders and ancestors are smooth. They're not jagged. Amen. It can be people. It can be elders. It can be gifts. It can be traditions. It can be institutions. It can be ancestors. It can be tools. What are your stones? Is it prayer? Is it fasting? Ah, what are your stones? Oh my gosh. Here's another question. We are already in community ritual. I love it, I love it. What is your slingshot? You see, you can't just go get stones. Stones don't do nothing by themselves. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Your slingshot is your work. The stones alone didn't just do it. David went down to the river. Okay, that's great. And then he went down and he got the five stones. That's great. He put them in his bag and he went back to the battlefield. But David had to put some effort to get the stones to land where he needed them to land. He needed a conduit to get the stones from point A to point B. The slingshot, which was probably made by him, uh, was the conduit, the, 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 the vessel to get the stones where he needed. He had to assert his efforts and his skills, because he had already got those skills out on his daddy's field, and he got that slingshot. And so if you said that your stone, one of your stones is prayer, then is your slingshot daily prayer time and spiritual work that you do to ensure that your prayer will go through? Is your slingshot fasting that propels your prayer? 
Is your slingshot having an accountability partner in your prayer to give you strength and to hold you accountable and to help you to get the strength that you need to shoot the stone? What is your slingshot? Is it grant writing? Is it showing up with excellence and consistency on your job when you feel like it and when you don't? Is it community organizing? And if so, what kind of community organizing are you doing, where and with who? What's your slingshot? If you named education as a stone, is your slingshot how you choose to teach and what you choose to teach? Is your slingshot starting an independent black school and standing in the tradition of elders and ancestors who did the same? What is your slingshot? Oh my God, I'm a whole space. That's so good, Omi. Is it That's your so good. Out? Some folks go in the classroom and they just they just teach just to be teach. They just reading off of the paper. They're not paying attention to how they teach, their pedagogy. They're not caring for the children or the youth or the adults that they're teaching. But the way you get that content through is through that slingshot of pedagogy. <laughs> oh my God. He took that stone and he put it in the slingshot. And he whirled that swing slingshot. Talk and about that work. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, it wasn't no, it wasn't no pullback. It was a, yeah, talk about old it. School. Old school slingshot. It wasn't the one you had when you were a kid that had the rubber band on the back of it that you got in trouble, amen, because you popped somebody with a rock. Nah. -uh. This was an ancient <laughs> slingshot, probably made out of leather, like the one you see in the brother's hand here. You took that and threw that rock. Do you know that there are folks on the African continent who still do this? I've seen it. I've seen sisters and brothers in Namibia take a slingshot and a rock and knock a black mamba snake out of a tree and kill it dead from a distance. That's correct. What is your slingshot? Is it discipline? A disciplined life? Is it choosing to raise children with discipline when the world seems to be going in a different child raising direction? Say that. But we want to raise some giant killers. And then finally, David used his stone to slay giants to kill Goliath, Goliath. The stone, it says, he, when he whipped it around, it landed directly smack in the middle of Goliath's forehead and he just fell forward and fell down. Your stone is education. Your stone is the Atlanta University Center. It's, your classroom is your slingshot, however you define it. What are you using them to bring forth? What do we need to slay? What giants need to fall? Name the giants that need to fall in the chat. Is it educational disparities? Is it teachers and parents choosing between sending their children to school and being exposed to a deadly disease or staying home and being alive but perhaps being challenged in terms of educational content? What giants need to fall? Is it health disparities? Is it mass incarceration? Is it white supremacy and discrimination? What is the giant that needs to fall? Is it ignorance? Is it chosen ignorance? Huh? What is the giant that needs it? Is it apathy around voting efforts? Because they both evil. Meanwhile, our ancestors became strange fruit to exercise that same right.
I want a whole space. Again. And I want to give us a minute as I play this song for us to write anything else we need to write in the chat. If you need to take a picture of the chat, if you need to record what you took, hallelujah. <laughs> 